Black Day of History, the unwhitewashed story of America. Uh, just a little intro so you guys know, tonight's event is being made possible because of your support. When you support Left Bank Books, your money goes directly into the local economy. It helps us keep our bookstores open, our streets paved, our libraries funded. And uh, it also keeps uh, your parks clean and booksellers fed, and we thank you for it. Um, thank you all so much for shopping local and supporting our event. And we always, always, always love our partnership with the St. Louis Libraries. And we thank the Schlafly branch for their eternal hospitality and their support. My name is Danielle King. I'm the general manager at Left Bank. I also run our used books department. Um, I get the opportunity tonight and many other times to help our fantastic events coordinator, Shane Mullen, who is right over there, uh, producing hundreds of author events every year. Um, and we just have the best team in St. Louis, and we really appreciate all the support you guys have offered over the years. Uh, we are really happy that we are doing so many more events, and uh, for a full list of our programming, you're absolutely welcome to check out our website, left-bank.com. I'm personally very excited. Tomorrow we are hosting Cedric the Entertainer, who will be talking about his debut novel, Flipping Boxcars, at the High Point Theater. We will also be at Tower Grove Pride all weekend, so please do come by and say hi. We'll have some of our friends in with us, Esme Simon smith Raphael Frumkin, and S.L. Coney. One more last plug, and this one I'm personally very excited about as well. Um, Adia Harvey Wingfield, a Washington University sociologist, has a book coming out called Gray Areas, How the Way We Work Perpetuates Racism and What We Can Do to Fix It. So look for that next month. And now for tonight's author. Michael Harriet is a critically acclaimed poet, journalist, and broadcaster, a senior writer for Group.com, and his work is often cited by outlets and individuals from outlets ranging from the New York Times to the Washington Post. I've personally been getting the group in my RSS feeds for a very long time, and it is a treat for me to be here with you tonight and to be with Michael. Uh, Michael holds a degree in mass communications and arts from Auburn University, and we're going to get into this because I'm going to make a little bit of fun of it. Um, an MA in macroeconomics from Florida State. I went to the University of Miami. We do, we, we have to, it's a thing. You'll feel it, you'll feel it. <laughs> um, and since we're going to talk about the book, all I will say is this. My favorite quote from the publisher print is, for too long, we have refused to acknowledge that American history is white history. Not this one. This history is black AF. On behalf of Left Bank Books and the Schlafly Library, please, Give me a warm welcome for Michael Harriet to discuss Black Lives Matter.
Okay, so we're going to start. Mike's going to talk to us a little bit about this. I mean, some of you have it in your hands, but you guess what? Yeah, so, uh, just a little kind of a primer on the book. It is, uh, I, when I started writing this book a couple, three years ago now, uh, one of the things, uh, well, first of all, I never, I was, my plan wasn't to write a history book. Mm -hmm. I took a book uh, that was based on the, core, the course that I used to teach, the college course, called Race as an Economic Construct. And every publisher that I visited was ready to publish it, but they all said, hey, but what about that history thing you always do? And so when I, the book deal, the one book deal became a two book deal. And the funny part is that uh, we, are, we flipped the order of the books because the first book, the subtitle, the publisher insisted that no one had ever heard of it and that uh, I would, you know, need some time for people to even kind of grasp onto the idea. And the subtitle of that book, it was called White Depology. The subtitle was Toward a War Critical Race Theory. And the publisher was like, nobody's ever heard of this critical race theory thing. And, and, uh, and so now everybody's heard of it and I have a history book coming out. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, I guess you can uh, and but the premise of the book is simple. I think we talk about and learn about black history, right? Uh, history about black people from the perspective of black people. Then we talk about American history. And what I argue is that American history has always been a form of critical race theory. It's viewed through a white lens, it's given through a white perspective. And so we see black history through the eyes of black people. American history through the perspective of white people. And what I want to do, and what we rarely see, is American history through the eyes of black people, right? Like, black people have a really particular view of America that I think is interesting. And what we don't realize is that, right, we have a racialized, like, white is a race, and there's a racialized lens through which we usually um, absorb history. And I wanted to kind of one, turn it on this end by looking at America and whiteness through black people's lens to, to kind of show how racialized the opposite perspective is. And then to two, to just give a perspective on this country and its history that we never really talk about. That sounds wonderful. For my friends who uh, have not picked up the book yet, in the very first part of the book, you talk about the middle room. I would like to talk about the middle room because I also had a middle room. Okay. And uh, I'm super curious about like what brought you back to that. Uh, we wanna, I want to chart a path of how you got to write this book. Um, so like, what made you start thinking about that space before you got to the place where you were writing the book? Like, it's clearly, it's, it's a part of your mind, it's part of your history. So like, talk to me a little bit about that middle room. So the middle room, so for people who hadn't read the book yet or had picked it up, I start out by talking about I, me being homeschooled. And we were homeschooled in the house that my grandfather built. And in the middle of the house was a room that generations of my family deposited all of their books. It was basically a den, but we just called it the middle room. And it was just lined with books from generations and generations of my family. Well. I use that to explain how I not just view history, but the world. So history being homeschooled wasn't like a subject matter. Like in regular school, you study English and then history and then math and science. Well, that wasn't really how I learned. So science was part of math and math was part of English and English was part of history. So when you read history, you're not necessarily just reading about America's past, you're learning how you're learning grammar and you're learning how to think, and you're learning critical thinking. And that is the way I kind of, that the way my mind develops. So I don't think of history as a separate thing from like understanding politics. And so a lot of what I'm known for is kind of giving that context level. Well, no, it's part history and part science and part sociology, the way you have to understand why things are. And so that middle room was, uh, you know, it was very 
it was very important to how I was raised because there was like the books, when I think about it, like the books were arranged in any sort of way. And I talk about, even in the first page of the book, how I, I started reading W.E.B. Du Bois's Souls of Black Folk because I had just finished Soul of the Robot. It was like, okay, this got to be like a sequel or something. That book was good. So. And so that is kind of my introduction to the history also of America through this lens that wasn't really tainted by a white perspective. That's wonderful. Um, I'm also super interested in how you ended up getting an MA in macroeconomics and why you chose Florida State when the University of Florida and the University of Miami were right there. Talk to me. Explain this to so, me. So <laughs> two things. Um, the University of Florida State is better. And uh, also, <laughs> the, the other thing was uh, macroeconomics, like I kind of backed into it. So, I went to, I participated in a program for graduate school that was a, a experiment that allowed students to create their own path, uh, a graduate course. Like you could create your own degree. So I combined history and macroeconomics and international business and to get basically my own course of study. Well, to get into the program, I had to, the summer before the program, I had to take uh, basically told me I needed one more course, like a graduate level course. And so I just took this law school course called Critical Race. And, uh, and so my initial plan was to be a filmmaker. So I was majoring in film from the first day as a film school. Maybe it's better than film. <laughs> and, um, and so, but I changed my mind and then changed my uh, major and taught this in part of the program was also you had to create a course, um, create a curriculum for a course. You didn't necessarily have to teach the course, but they were going to choose one of the curriculums and ask the students to teach it. And mine was chosen. It was called Race as an Economic Construct. And it was from this new thing that I learned about political race theory that combined, instead of using history and philosophy to talk about race, using concrete economic terms, math and science. And so I taught that and had a fellowship where I didn't have to pay for grad school. It's the only way anyone should ever go to grad school. Um, I love that. And it sounds like your middle room, as mine was also, it was the back den, uh, just because that one had more room for shelves. But it's the same thing, years and years of my family just putting, dropping books there and no order. And, and you kind of learn interdisciplinary studies for my, my, my academics in the room. Um, which is something that a lot of people kind of look down on, but we ask, we say this all the time, how could you possibly answer questions about how the world is with one set of tools, right? right. You are from the cradle taught about multiple kinds of tools. So that's that's very cool to me. Um, never really spoke Yeah, never thought about it in terms of interdisciplinary studies. Oh, I, I could not not. <laughs> um, it was it was a very it was very striking. Um, so I'm actually gonna go ahead and again, this is not a spoiler. You guys know. Uh, it's American history, or something like that. We're all going to know soon. Um, but one of my favorite lines in the book is actually from the third chapter, and it's when you're talking about the Milwaukee. And um, the line is, they balanced the memories of their motherland on the bridges of their noses and hid them in the tips, on the tips of their tongues. And you're talking about a, a people, and you're talking about preservation of the Geechee language, and you go on to talk about how it's managed to survive despite coming on and, and despite existing under tremendous oppression. And so I want to talk a little bit about reclaiming our heritage when it's been kind of taken. I want to talk about some of the project in the book. How do you see it as a step in that idea of reclaiming a heritage that's been kind of taken from you? Well, so one of the things about the Geechee Gullah, I would argue, is that, first of all, it was never oppressed, and it was never hidden uh, or, or taken. Like, it thrives. Like, my family, if you went to my house, you probably wouldn't understand what we were talking about because we still speak it. People around us still speak it. I remember during the pandemic, um, I hadn't been home in a year. And then, so I was commissioned to write an article about the plantation tourism industry in Charleston. And so I went to Charleston and I like stopped to get like a Red Bull or something at a 
a uh, convenience store and I could hear the accent and it's like almost brought tears to my eyes mm -hmm. just to hear it compared to not being able to hear it for a long time. But the thing is that it was never really taken and always thrive. And the other thing is it was never oppressed because what I talk about in the book was that the reason that culture developed, so the each of the color culture, this kind of a mix of West African culture, Caribbean culture, and uh, you know, well, there really was no American culture, right? But when these people were imported from different kingdoms in Africa, and a lot, mostly the Caribbean, look, we never really talk about the Caribbean aspect of, of our black history. They developed their own language. But the way that language and that culture was developed was because the process of growing rice was so fraught with disease and so hot that white people weren't around. So slavery in South Carolina existed under what we call the task system. So, you know, you think about people picking cotton on a plantation with supervisor, but that, that wasn't how it was, in, uh, in, especially on, on the coast of South Carolina. So they did their work, they knew what they had to do, and then they were allowed to grow their own food, they could go to the market and sell the food that they grew. And so that task system, system allowed them to create their own language and a way to communicate with each other without white people being around. One of my favorite quotes is a guy saying that he uh, he had a plantation in South Carolina and he said he'd rather be shot at by the best Kentucky rifleman than to spend the summer on a rice plantation in South Carolina. That's just how treacherous it was. I mean, it was it was hard. It was, you know, the life expectancy, for instance, um, was 19 years old on uh, the uh, rice plantations, but it allowed this culture to develop and flourish that was a mix of different African cultures and basically the diaspora, and it still survives to this day. That's what you call a professional, ladies and gentlemen, it was a um, I wanted you to talk about that, that was excellent. Um, you're telling a huge story across this book. You are going all the way back to what we think of as the start of everything, right? At what point were you at in your life when you realized that your view of American history was different than what other people were interacting with? When I started going to public school, so it was about 12 years old. And when I would be in social studies class and realized, oh, this ain't even the America, like I've never heard of this place that y'all were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but really, when I, like it was only a few years ago when my children were in school and I saw how they learned about history, then I realized why people have these perspectives. And so it was a, like a slow coming to terms with how other people view America. Because one of the things that I point out is that how you grow up, you think of it as normal, right? So I when I read about you know WB Du Bois thinking about say black people try to you know have these two parts of themselves right one that we show to white people and then one that how we communicate with each other well i when i read that i had never been around white people so i was like what are they talking about <laughs> like and one of the things that people told me later on in life was like you don't know how to talk to white people because i had never really interact i was living in the dominant culture which was black culture until I was 12. So, you know, I think that we sometimes don't know how we have this subconscious deference to whiteness that we all absorb and then, you know, uh, regurgitate um, subconsciously. And I never learned how to do that. So people think of me as like combative or, or because I say white people when, you know, I think what's wrong with saying it? I, that's that's really funny because in a in a real way a lot of this is this book is saying that what we think we know about American history is a myth, um, and myths are these just gross simplifications sometimes of humanity. And you are unmythologizing American history, and you are adding it by giving all of this depth. There are going to be stories that y'all read about in here that are going to blow your mind. What is the thing when you were researching for the book that you found that was like I. 
this has to go in the book. I have to put this in the book. Like a thing that was maybe new to you. So, uh, well, there were a lot of things that were new to me. Um, one of the things that I think that was, like I, I mentioned it, but I don't harp on it, because this book not just go, comes a long period of time. I think there are subjects where it goes into depth, right? like how the rice culture influenced America and why that's important mm -hmm. to black people. Um, but it goes into depth. But one of the things that I tried to do was not to just say, this is a thing that happened here, and here's what I think about it. But what I wanted to do is give the perspective of black people who were alive and uh, so during that era. So one of the things that I used was a lot of black newspapers and archives. But one of the things that I found when I would do that is I would run across two sentences so often that it was surprising to me. So I started putting that in a book in the book whenever I encountered it. Burned by a white mob, no surviving copies exist. It is amazing how often I ran into those two phrases. Like, we'll know this copy, like, there'll be something by Ida B. Wells. We know she wrote about it on this day. And I'll look for it, they'll say, well, Malbec was burned by a white mob. No surviving copies exist. You'll see it in, like, HBCU archives, right? Like, if you go into almost any black college, you'll see that there's a building that was built, like, in 1900. And then there'll be a plaque that says, well, the original uh, building was burned by a white mob in 1879. And then this is the replacement building. So those that was something that really survived pride. That's wild. That's wild. Well, I'll say as a person who spent a lot of time in school, this book is the best textbook I've ever read, um, as such that it is. There are even, I, I thought that the unit and uh, uh, activities and quizzes and stuff were <laughs> choice. Um, but at the same time, it's also a little bit of a memoir. We are getting a lot of your personal history, not the least of which in the things you go into, like the rice plantations. Um, it's a, definitely a historical excavation, but it is also, on its way, kind of an entertainment object. I mean, this is a very funny book. You will not get through it without laughing out loud a couple of times. And I'm curious if you can talk about why you felt it was necessary and or appropriate to use humor in some because some of these stories are hard, but also they're funny. Like it's told in a funny way. You're hearing it from a person sitting next to it. Oh man, I gotta tell you about this crazy thing. Well, I gotta tell you about this. What do you think? I think first, I think that is the way I write generally with humor. And I don't necessarily search for a joke to include I always say that what I do is just not remove the humor um, instead of trying to include the humor. And the other thing is that's also the way that black people relate to each other. Like we could be at the funeral for our grandma, and if something is funny, we look at that head on my yeah. sister Johnson, because that's fun. Like, so that's also the way that we relate to each other, and I wanted to relate the, the book to, to speak to people and to be accessible. So that's the other thing is that I wanted to make it, this book I think goes deep into subjects. It's not just a broad thing like this happened on this day. It tells these, it goes in depth like, you know, there's again chapters on rice, a whole chapter on how rice influenced America or I think you can really tell when I, I'm really, really interested in a subject like chapter one maroons, and like, we talk about the underground railroad, but not these maroon communities in America. Um, things like that. But I wanted it also be for people who might not ever read a history book, but pick it up, read a couple pages, and say, "Oh, this is interesting in its own way." Just as it's just a good story right here, right? And I think humor does that. It captures people in a way that even when you're going, going into depth, into subjects that they might not have thought they cared about, if you do it with humor and make it relatable, then they'll stay engaged. For sure. I relate very deeply. I've been at many a funeral, and there was too much laughing. Um, but it's great. It's great. So a lot of what, to this point of going deep, there are a lot of these like little historical vignettes, either of people or instances or events that take place, and they, they're full of detail full of historical information. And something I kept noticing is, man, America really likes ancient dudes. 
we got a lot of them. That is a lot of our cultural history. A lot of our myths are around these dudes who suck, really, really suck. I'm thinking in particular of uh, Ponce de Leon's thigh poisoning, but also just the story of every election in my life. Um, is there just like some really low standard that America has for its heroes? Is like, we, like, are we just like, so, like, told to take this and we just are like, yeah, 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 obviously he was a flawed man, but what is our thing with that? Well, I think it's part of just myth making, right? Like you make people into a hero and how we arrive at those heroes, like the reason Christopher Columbus became a hero was because when, after we fought the Revolutionary War, we were like, yeah, we don't want to make it. English hero, so who could we say to discover America? Oh, how about I got Christopher Columbus? And you know, somebody was in the room probably saying, oh, but he never he never stepped foot on his bed. Yeah, but who cares about that? He's not English, it's fine. Right. So, you know, part of it is that, and part of it is just uh, the perpetuation of this mythology is because a lot of people who teach and call themselves historians, they believe this book yeah. stuff too, right? Like, yeah. They believe it too. It's fine, I said ain't shit. Sure. Yeah, um, right. and they believe it too. And because like the reason we perpetuate a lot of history, mis historical misinformation, is because your social studies teacher don't know nothing about history. She had some white person who taught her, that had some white person who taught them, that had some white person who taught them, from a textbook that was created and, and approved by the daughters of the Confederacy and the same people who built the Confederate monuments control the textbook industry. And we talk about that in this book. But like all of that historical myth making, at some point, once it becomes perpetuated so long that it becomes truth as much as George Washington's cherry tree and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Low standards, that's my thing. We have low standards. Um, you did a thing I was really excited about as a person who used to study the black church um, a lot. Um, it's just impossible to talk about black history without talking about the church. For my piece, I always believed that even if you've never stepped foot inside of a black church, you owe a lot of your understanding of blackness to it. And you talk about that a little bit. Um, I'm curious about your thoughts and maybe also your interaction with the sanctuary as you refer to black church. So I grew up in a real fundamentalist church um, and a really religious family. So I went to church four nights a week. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time in church. But in the book, what I don't go into is like not perpetuation of religion, but understanding and what I what I call and what the boys call the black religion, which is a different. I argue that it is a different. Um, sect of Christianity than like Protestantism, and it was developed because what like when you contextualize history, which is not what we do well when we learn dates and time and people, right? So the King James Bible was created like we talk about the King James Bible, and we talk about the Virginia Charter that was created by that was signed by King James. It's the same guy. So like America was created almost America's development was almost parallel with our version of Christianity, right? Like 1609 was the Virginia Charter, 1609 was the King James Version of the Bible, the first authorized ver version of the Bible. So that version of what we call Christianity, you know, that Protestant American form developed along. So the black people who came here in the early 1600s, and even before then, I, you know, the first black people who were not here, didn't come here in 1619. There's a whole chapter on that right so they had like there was no religion for like christianity for them to follow so their understanding of christianity folded in african tradition african religion caribbean religion santeria um even catholicism like and islam and Af and all of the ways that they understood god right and sometimes they hid their religion in understand their understanding of Christianity because you know sometimes it was illegal for you to worship. There were actual South Carolina law had laws that said like you could not pray, right? So when you hear the song, when I fall down on my knees and uh, with my face to the rising sun, the sun uh, come let us break bread together is the old Christian Negro spiritual. That's 
They're talking about enslaved people who were worshiping Islam and said, now nah, we're just gonna say Jesus, but like it'll be alright. Like that's a, it's, it's a it's a Christian hymn about worshiping Islam, and we never think about that. Um, you know, the whole cultures on the coast say, Oh, you know, my cousin, they pray on the beat. They're talking about um Islamic worship. We uh, you know, it wasn't crazy for them to adopt this guy called Jesus because the story of Jesus existed before Christianity, right? So they had heard uh, about and worship gods that were born of a virgin who, uh, of, you know, who were crucified and died for three days and came back to life. They had heard all of that. They, those stories predate Christianity. So what they developed in their understanding, what we call like some of the things that you guys recognize as Christian religions or Af religious traditions or African tr religious traditions. What you call those catching the Holy Ghost, the rich shout? That's an old Caribbean thing, right? That the Geechee Gullah introduced to Christianity, mm -hmm. right? Like shouting, right? That's speaking in tongues, right? Like is the way, it, I mean, it's in the Bible, but the way that it became part of the Christian, Christian tradition was through the Geechee Gullah people hiding what they were really saying. Like, we're going to just act like we're doing a Christian thing. And what are y'all saying? So we're speaking in tongues, officer. And it became part of the Christian tradition, right? So I think it's, I use what that chapter is called the Negro comma spiritual to understand black people's development along with the ch our understanding of religion. Because among us, there wasn't a separation of politics and religion. It was all about liberation and ways to get free, I, I'd say. And so that's how we understood all of it. Yeah, yeah you're getting a lot of that interdisciplinary stuff, right? This is a lot of different things at once, and I think it's fantastic. If For no other reason than I don't think, like I said, I, I studied this, and I have always said, the church gives racial actualization like a possibility and a place because there's a safe building in which you get to be a whole person. You get that. Um, so speaking of the church, I want to talk about food. Uh, there are some great recipes in this book, y'all. Um, uh, talk to me about the way that food has really colored the way that you think about the history of blackness in this country, keeping in mind, of course, you come from rice country. So. so, yeah, so my family owned restaurants and were cooks. And so, again, there is no separation. So the history of food reflects the history of this country. I talk, there are, there are uh, what the publisher calls interstitials. Uh, but some of them are called food stops, where we go into the history of a particular kind of food through the lens of black history, for instance. Like I said, rice, the history of fried chicken, right, was a, a, something that black people created. The history of, like, I, there's a whole part about rice perlo versus food, bar, uh, chicken bar. And, like, anybody from South, who's not from South Carolina wouldn't probably even know what those two words meant. But there's a whole big, uh, 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 argument over those two that's as big as like uh, jo the Jolliffe Wars in uh, <laughs> between the Nigerian Jolliffe and, and uh, Ghanaian Jolliffe. Mm -hmm. But in South Carolina, it's it's the Perlo Wars or the Chicken Bob Wars. And we understand, um, you know, I give the history of stuff like, you know, you understand, like, for instance, there's a whole thing about like how we talk about Thomas Jefferson's how mean of a person he was. And you know he gotta be mean if this man he enslaved invented macaroni and cheese and he still didn't free him. You know you gotta be mean as hell, right? Um, so we, we talk about you know uh, history through food in this book too. And you know, I bring my family in it and some of their recipes. You're all very lucky for them, they're excellent. Um, I'm going to have just a couple more discussion questions, but for our audience, like, make sure you're thinking of anything. We'll go around as soon as we get through. Um, you also talk a little bit, to bring up, to go back to Ida B. Wells a tiny bit, you bring up a little bit about like the way that literacy was kind of 
kept back from um, particularly enslaved populations, but black folks more broadly. And it does something, I think, for a group of folks to discover the power of being able to communicate via letters and to, not the power, right, but to do so unencumbered, because that's the biggest issue to your, uh, this has been burned by a white mob comment. Um, how do you see yourself picking up that legacy by doing this book? Because I, I, I feel it a little bit, but how do you see it? Well, I think one, I think when you think about, uh, you know, one of the things that we hear a lot of as you're black is if y'all just focus on education mm -hmm. and work hard, mm -hmm. like we build a whole country, like they literally, like one of the things I always point out is you think about this. Black people arrived here not knowing how to speak a language. And they learned the language. And they taught themselves it so well, they had to literally pass laws to say, we will kill you if you learn how to read. If you get any smarter, we will cut off your head and put it on a spike and leave it there for everybody else to see. And then after they were emancipated, we built a whole network of schools. Historically black schools, historically black colleges, and not just we talk about historically black colleges, but after the Civil War, the black uh, school uh, attendance rate was higher than the white school attendance rate in the South. Mm -hmm. So we went to school, we valued education, and not only that, but the majority black constitutional delegation of South Carolina in 1868 literally created the American school system as we know it. It did not exist before they created. There was never in the history of this country a constitutionally mandated, publicly funded education system until black people from South Carolina created it. And then after emancipation, we created schools and colleges, they burned them down. And then even after, during the civil rights era, like we said, okay, we value education so much, we will let you spit on our, in our kids' face as long as they can get an equal education. And now, for some reason, you say, we need to value education. When the reality is, there's never been a nanosecond in the history of America where black people have had access to an equal or full educational system that treated them like human beings. And we still value it, right? That, to me, is part of the story that needs to be told, right? Like, you, when you see American history, objectively and then the way we think of some things is valuable and some things are not right like if a white man wrote it down it is valuable but not black oral histories right when they are on their face just as accurate and just as valuable because george washington's cherry tree and the the wooden teeth all of those are really just something some white person wrote down and we knew it was a lie and we just kept telling people, George Washington had 11 slaves when he was born. Like, ain't no way he had ever chopped down the cherry tree. Let's get that right? So, so I think the un the unmyth making of America is, I think, is valuable using the perspective and the the voices and the recollections of Black. That's wonderful. Also, you can get like an oral history about anything published now. Like, I just saw the one about ESPN and this whole thing. Um, all right. So, there is a book called We Testify With Our Lives, written by Terrence Johnson, um, and it is talking about black religion and its impact on radical politics throughout history. He also picks up that WDB Du Bois quote um, How does it feel to be a problem? And he contrasts it with uh, Tony Kate Bombardo's The Salt Eaters um, and the question she asks in that novel, which is, do you want to be well? Michael, can this book make us well? So I think it, well is relative because <laughs> like it implies that you ain't that something's wrong with you. Mm -hmm. Right? Because the thing to me that this the read the book this book is about when you think about black people coming to this country with nothing not a language not people who loved them not uh history anything and when they were their purpose of being brought here was to extract every bit of knowledge 
and labor out of them and you can die of it. And in a relatively short period of time, all of the things that we have built, the schools, the, the, the communities, the families, the institutions, with the knowledge and the reality that there is nothing that has ever been done to a human being on the face of the earth in the history of this world that hasn't been done to black people in mass. Like they burn, they bomb, they like everything, right? Cut off their heads in front of their children, rape, pillage, everything. And to see what black people have accomplished in this relatively short period of time is really the greatest story in the history of the world. Right? You think about that, right? Black, like, not just from scratch, but from like negative scratch. Yeah. Like, we really from <laughs> negative scratch. Right? And then you think about if you juxtapose it with the people who constructed a society and gave themselves every systemic advantage. And, you know, excuse my language, but when they look over their shoulders, they see, like, we own their ass. Mm. Like, that's a part of what this whole consternation is about, this woke CRT, strike down affirmative action. is like, all of the advantages historically did not matter to us. And when you look at the trajectory, you see that the truth and justice is going to win, right? That's the greatest story, and that's the lesson to me. Like. The last part of this, to, to answer your question, I don't know if you backwards constructed the question, but the last chapter of the book is like, there is nothing wrong with black people. There is something wrong with America. And once you understand that, and you realize that you are part of the greatest story that has ever been told, I don't think you have to Ask yourself either of the, those two questions. Okay. Michael, here you go. Yeah. All right, if you've got any questions, please raise your hand. I'll come from the room. Hopefully, get the feedback. <laughs> Thank you so much for your talk. I want to say that the book would definitely make as well as well as as well as as well as the uh, your uh, Twitter feed and your podcast. I want to say the first Twitter feed is probably the greatest episode ever. Thank you. Um, so this book is coming at a time where we have uh, Eva Max Candy, we have uh, the Gohan Jones, and I feel like and maybe it's just me wanting to claim and own you know like this piece, but um, I feel like they're writing for black people as well as a the larger audience, and I'm just curious as to when you sat down to write this book, who who was the audience that you were thinking about? Because this is very feels like this is this is for us. I mean, other people can read it and be a part of it. This is like this is us. If we own this, right? Yeah, I think that's always what I've written for again because I don't know how to kind of tailor my voice. And the other thing is, have you ever been somewhere and somebody like you you said you turn to somebody? And say, like, did you hear that noise? Or did you see this thing? Or did you feel that? And like, you feel a draft? Sometimes this country, like living in America as a black person is like that. Like you want to turn, like they'll make you believe, like, there ain't no racism. What you talking about? Like, you, you don't feel nothing. Like, nah, nah, there's no racism breeze, bro, blowing. You crazy. And I think my perspective and the way I write has always been. Not, I don't consider myself the voice of black people. I consider myself, because I that would mean I'm talking to somebody that is listening to black people for black people. I consider myself talking to black people saying, hey, yo, you ain't my, I, I feel that shit too, bro. Like that, that, and so that is who I write for. Like anybody can read it, but it is undergirded with the thing that I am talking among, we are talking amongst each other and somebody can listen in, which we don't have to whisper today, bro. Like, I got the words to say it, and we don't care if they hear me.
I actually do. I actually have a virtual uh, question from our virtual audience. Um, I think they heard you that film, that film school stuff. Uh, if you could create a biopic or TV series about any black figure from the past, who would it be? Uh, Mansa Musa, perhaps? So, uh, luckily, that's not a, he was talking about a podcast that I have called Trade Tool Maniacs, where we get celebrities to tell some of these un untold stories. And uh, if, I, I think if I got the chance to do one person or a, se a series on one person, it would probably be uh, TRM Howard, just because like you could tell all the backstories through this one person from uh, Mount Bayou, Mississippi. You could tell the whole story of the civil rights movement, um, reconstruction, slavery, the Underground Railroad. One guy is connected to all of that, and so it would probably be all right, we had one other one, which was, oh, what is the figure or story that you encountered while researching the book that um, took you the most by surprise? It's a variation on what we asked, but like what figure, what's, what person that you were looking into? Did you find out some stuff that not only did you not know, you would have never guessed? Yeah, uh, so it's kind of connected to what I just said. Moses Dixon was this guy who... Uh, who was playing, he, it's funny, we were in St. Louis, in a house, met in the house, 10 or 12 guys met in the house in St. Louis, and pledged that they would not stop fighting until all, all the slaves are free. And they had planned a national underground slave revolt, and just so happened the Civil War started before the day, but they, they had drilled 200,000 people across the South in different cities, and they were going to march their way toward Atlanta. And they funded, they had white people funding them and funding the Underground Railroad. They had a network of uh, spies. Uh, the guy, one of them was a, a representative who's, who Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali was named after. Cassius Marcellus Clay is named after a funder a secret funder of the Underground Railroad, who was a sitting congressman. Um, and it just, again, the Civil War broke out. So they they switched, and these 12 men still remain secret, called themselves the Knights of Tabor. They created a, a secret society, an underground fraternity. By the 1920s, they had raised so much money, just in 50 cents per quarter of dues, that they built what is called the Taborian Hospital in Mount Bayou, Mississippi. Um, it's the first black built hospital. And almost everything you know about this civil rights history is connected to that city. Um, it's where like he had a, they had a, a insurance company and a bunch of their insurance salesmen ended up being guys who worked in the civil rights movement like Medgar Evers and this little, skinny guy named Jesse Jackson. And uh, he, one of his preachers had a daughter named Aretha Franklin who became the voice of the civil rights movement. And Billy Preston who became the sixth key. And all of that is connected to Moses Dixon too. But that is a fascinating story to me. All right, let's go. Okay. Um, hello, um, thank you first of all for um, the information that you're sharing. I have to admit, I've not read the book yet. Um, but what is your perspective, and do you talk about um, the very early years of the country forming, the John Hanson piece, the Articles of Confederation, and the early work prior to George Washington and that group and us helping them put together the documents that this country relies on? And the second question is, what's wrong with Florida A&M? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I actually have to so, yeah, so I do talk about the early uh, America, we start, as a matter of fact, in the 1400s. And again, a lot of people don't know that Africans had come here, had been in America a century before, 1619, yes. living here, um, building communities here. And as far as the founding fathers, I do talk about that. And I do talk about it from the black, a black perspective. So one of the things I talk about was, is that when you look at for instance, the Revolutionary War through the eyes of the black people who were here. 
it was just two different kinds of white people fighting, right? Like, like it was, and so the people, the black people who were here, joined the side which most affected their freedom, right? So four times as many people fought for the British during the Revolutionary War than the American side. And so, and, the, and one of the interesting things that we talk about in the book is that there is an African American diaspora. So those people who fought for the British, that's where that's why the Bahamas is black because the British exported them to the Bahamas, to uh, to Canada, and so there's uh, African American diaspora that are people who are descendants of enslaved people who. Or were expatriates from America because they fought for their freedom in whether it was the Revolutionary War or the Civil War, who, who have built communities all over the country, Sierra Leone, uh, Canada, Bahamas, all over the Caribbean. So uh, the, the light goons um, that basically patrolled the seas uh, before slavery was eliminated in America, we do talk about all those things. All right, we've got another one back here. Uh, are you from South Carolina? Yes. And if you are Tim Scottish from South Carolina, why is your experience so different from his? <laughs> <laughs> so, I was, so my so my parents live right outside of North Charleston. I've lived in North Charleston, which is Tim, where Tim Scott's district is from. Um, I've been out of our experiences work that different Tim Scott's family was enslaved. Um, Tim Scott has created a mythology around much of his experience with his poor grandfather, who was one of the biggest landowners in South Carolina, was, you know, I don't know. And so, but Tim Scott early um, was kind of embraced by conservatives and taught this mythology of America. And I've interviewed Tim Scott, where he realizes the illogical of what he believes. Like he says, well, he doesn't deny that the specific things happen, but he just doesn't want to define them as racist. So he believes like, yeah, um, police do pull over black people disproportionately, and they patrol black people disproportionately. I don't know if that's called systemic racism. <laughs> so, so, and he's had this conversation with me on the record. So, um, like, I, again, but you can, again, have the same experience and interpret it differently. That's one of the things that we know about history. I think that's just like, he didn't have to know where I'm. He didn't have, he didn't have, he, he read the wrong books, right? He's got yeah. the wrong books. Um, if there are no more questions, I will, oh, oh there it is. I sat down, I'm just, I'm, I'm so sorry, by all means. Um, thank you for all of your studies and your contribution. Thinking about the conversations uh, in the past where we did have some storytelling, I had a 104-year-old uncle who, and he was an in-law, but he knew much of the history of his wife's family. And that's where I learned about Geechee Goa and many other things. I feel like this book um, gives us another opportunity to create conversation so that we know and those coming behind us will know and can accept the pride of who we actually are instead of what we're being taught. I learned very early um, in a Catholic school and so, yes, I understand that we, as a black people, we live in two spaces. We are white. We know how to talk around whites, uh, be accepted around whites so that we don't fall. We, we fit into a certain category as well as being black and who we are when we are not around whites. And it is, I feel like this book creates that opportunity for us to have that discussion and to say, yes, I do feel it. Like, no, there is nothing wrong with you. Um, I have a, a, a shoe, a post-op shoe on, where I had a blister uh, suffering from diabetes, where they said, oh no, 
the infection's gone to the bone, so you need to have an amputation. And my gut said no. And so I suffered in the hospital with the treatment that I refused medical treatment because I didn't go with the amputation because they felt like my circulation was poor and that there was no way that that tissue could regrow. There is no way that you, the medication can fit and reach that toe. Well, I still have five toes. That was Mother's Day. So thinking about how we have been as healers and spiritual, none of that is included obviously in the history books and you I, I just thank you for the rice um i never understood why i was so drawn to the rice well <laughs> i didn't know until that that was my people and so we um have been trained to just think about the cotton fields and and that so thank you right and i think that's a, a good point there's a uh a part of the book that talks about Onesimus, who was uh, the person who brought inoculation of vaccine to America, the creation of vaccines. Probably, I, I, I argue that he probably has saved more lives than any single person in the history of the world because he taught us how to uh, inoculate for such smallpox. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things about Onesimus is you think about, so he was enslaved by the Mather family, the people who kind of started Harvard in um, Yale, you know, Cotton Mather, the guy from the St. Louis tribe. So who what, uh, Onesimus had learned from people in the Caribbean, and people in uh, Northern Africa, and North African Muslims when you learn anachronism. So you think about this, who was the scientist? Who was the scholar in that situation? Like the people were saying, burn the witches, because I got spectral evidence that these people were witches, right? Because of my science training. Or the black man who was saying, hey, if you just uh, pluck the skin and inject a little bit of pus, then you'll develop antibodies. And they say, you must be crazy to try to do this. Because you know, Benjamin Franklin had, you know, inspired people, inspired the first anti vaccine movement that bombed Mather's house because. He thought that this vaccine nonsense was some nonsense, right? And so, but you think about who was the scholar and who was the idiot in that equation. But because one went to an accredited school that white people said was a school that had scholars, Cotton Mather, the burn the witch that state guy, was considered a scholar. And the slave was considered a crazy man with witchcraft and, you know, some kind of healing, uh, African healing, and not that it was scientifically sound. Thank you so much for what you said. I'm so inspired. I can't wait to read it. Um, I do have a question. I'm sorry we got here late. We went to the wrong store. <laughs> so now that I've excused all that, um, I wonder what your feelings are. You know, we're celebrating 50 years of hip hop. And I wonder what your thoughts are about the celebration and also how hip hop has maybe evolved and devolved and also um, current state of politics right now. I know it's a big question. Thank you. So my, my okay, feeling, will tell us everything. I'm feeling hip hop and, and the art form as a whole. Um, I am, so I grew up with hip hop, like, you know, me and hip hop are the same age. Mm -hmm. On the mic, please. And, and yeah, the mic is dead. Mic's oh. dead. Here, um, so, but my feeling about hip hop is sometimes we ascribe to art or culture the things that are just in society in general. And I think many of the criticisms of hip hop are criticisms of capitalism, or criticisms of culture in general. I, I would ask you to think about this. The difference in hip hop in the early days and hip hop now is that from its inception, hip hop was something that was kind of controlled by the artists and the people in the streets. And like the people determine who's going to be the hip hop artist. And now it's 
just another form of the capitalist. Like black people do not control hip hop. We cannot make a hip hop star. And when you think about that art form that was so ingrained in the culture, not being controlled by the culture, it's controlled by capitalism, right? And as it's it's always funny to me. I always tell people when you think of when you wonder why someone is being like promoted as a hip as a star, go look at how you'd be surprised if you go look at how many actual records they sell, and it's not many. And if you're wondering, well, how do they get on this stage? And it, it sounds like a conspiracy theory, but when you go look at how many records a person actually sells versus how big, how much you see them on TV and on the platform, you begin to understand that, oh, it's a, the choice that these corporations are making. Because it's a corporate form of profit-driven form, of, and that's different from an art form. And I think when you talk about those, when you ask that question, you have to specify which one you're talking about. Are you talking about art form, or are you talking about the corporate um, form of entertainment that you see on McDonald's commercials and on MTV? You clarify. Right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. We got one more. There we go. There we go. One more. There we go. I was going to say, I, I sang a choir, honey. I can get loud. I know. I believe it. Okay, so it was announced today that the state of Missouri is number three in book banning, right behind Texas and Florida. So I'm guessing it's going to be hard AF. To <laughs> in front of our young people, you know, in this state. But so I'm wondering, have you already started, or has any group embraced the idea of how we can like start to form some book circles or maybe start our own middle rooms, you know, at a, at a micro level, at a national level, so that we can start educating <clears throat> ourselves and our youth, because this is the stuff that they need to, that they need to learn. And you know you ain't getting this in St. Louis Public School. But, so, yeah. Yeah, so there are Black uh, homeschooling platforms, Black uh, collectives. But not just um, K through 12, but like the largest online African studies uh, program, Nubia. Um, I can was, Google that? Yep, Nubia, K N U B I A. Uh, it started by uh, Dr. Greg Carr and Karen Hunter. And it's like it's when, when people are saying, hey, uh, where are we going to go in? Uh, people, black people leave, leave Twitter. It's funny because like the place already existed and there's black people who know and like, but they didn't, they didn't get on Twitter and said, hey y'all, this is the place because the place has already been built, this infrastructure already exists. There's tens of thousands of people who are already participating. And so again, you will think if you believe the popular narrative that black people ain't like, caring about education when we've already built the platforms, but like you gotta you gotta keep it quiet because again, burned by a white mom, no surviving copies. <laughs> also not for nothing, the Left Bank Foundation has a program that we give away banned books. We sell this book. I assure you we will continue to sell this book. We will make this book available for anybody who wants it. Um, if you could shout your last question, then we got to do our second one. Thanks. Um, it's interesting you mentioned Nubia because that's how I heard about you. You were on a on on your YouTube narrative, and you were speaking uh, with Karen Hunter and Dr. Carr, and you were on on a session with them. So I was just wondering when are you going to be back in that space and speaking with them again? I'll be on Karen Hunter's show uh, Friday. I think next Friday. Um, speaking to them and I do stuff with Nubia all the time. I'm a big supporter. Anytime they ask me to do something out there. So uh so I and I, I think Dr. Carr and I are going to do something in DC at uh at San So uh so look out for that too. Dr. Gregory Carr? Dr. Gregory Carr, yes. All right. Probably, like, our generation is the boy to me. <laughs>
Oh, okay. okay. All right. We appreciate all of y'all. We're going to do a signing line in just a couple of minutes, but up until then, we really appreciate you guys coming in one more time. A very warm welcome. So very <laughs>